Breathing in diesel exhaust fumes is like walking into a fire without a mask. Over time, those toxins lead to cancer. Protect yourself with MagnaGrip, the easiest, most reliable exhaust removal system that features a true 100% seal to eliminate diesel exhaust fumes. To get free grant assistance, visit MagnaGrip.com. Good evening and welcome to Scenes of Violence. I'm Steve Hamilton, your host. And this evening, we have a rather special guest. Special. It's a different, there's several different ways that we can articulate special. Um, we are blessed with my brother, Chris Hamilton, from the Ithaca Fire Department in upstate New York, um, where we, well, you were raised and I was born because I'm the black sheep of the family. Uh, welcome to the show. How are you? Thank you. It's good to be here. How are you? Fantabulous. It's good to see you. You're looking pretty good. good. Um, obviously, you're aware of the, of the show. and uh, I'm proud of you. Know, yeah, this uh, is good. Yeah. Now, it's a yeah, podcast. You're doing well. It's not over the phone anymore. Um, mm -hmm. I really don't have <clears throat> podcast but we're we're gonna roll with it um okay so the scenes of violence you and i grew up uh in a law enforcement household we did yep. um you know one could actually uh one could actually argue that uh we both experienced our first what would you say in an in, in emergency scene Violent incident together with dad. Yeah, we uh, did. That's yeah. right. The Our riot. Protest. Yeah. 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 The riot that occurred over the top of the car while we were sitting in it. Yeah. That was the protest that was going on at Cornell University. And that he was stopped off duty to pick up a paycheck. And they said, Oh, you guys stay in here in the car. I'll be right back. And next thing you know, there was the car was surrounded by students. And the student in question was, not happy about the arresting part so he started to fight back and it became a mob of students against one police officer yeah he uh he was trying to get in the door to the pe because i remember he came out and he said uh, there's a protest over at olin hall i'm gonna go see if they uh yep. if they want me to stay don't move right and he came back with the dude in flex cuffs and about 30 people i think it was pro-lifers behind him like screaming and spitting at him and he was just marching. Yeah, they had the station other. locked for safety, and he was trying to get his keys out of his pocket to unlock the door. He didn't realize it was locked, you know. Well, it Which is, on the other side. Yeah. Yep. And it's like, open the door. Um, and somebody came up with a with a knife and cut the guy's flex cuffs off, and he mm -hmm. went to run. And I remember Dad grabbing that guy by his ass and his neck and throwing him on top of the hood of the car. The yeah, I mean, I – yeah. I remember him uh, wrestling with the guy in the car and students grabbing his legs and trying to pull him off. And yeah, I mean, it's a lot when you're, when you're a young kid to watch that go on, you know? Well, you had this, you had this, uh, the smart enough sense. Cause I was in the front seat and you were in the back yep. seat. You're like, lock the doors. Yeah. I wanted to. Yeah. Well, in retrospect, I, I probably didn't know, what it is but if you think about it you know as we're both now fathers if you have to worry about your kid and the emergency that's tough you know yeah that wouldn't have gone well no. um I, so. and also ironically if i remember correctly the first officer that showed up was bobby day he was yeah there. i mean i remember i remember one officer coming out and she got we watched the student jump on her back. So that I mean, so her, stole her radio and her hat. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there was, they were definitely outmanned for a lot of it until they finally started to break up. But I think their goal was just to get him free. And once they got him free, then they all kind of scattered. But, yeah, yeah. He was trying to hold on to a couple of them too. Yeah. But Bobby day came in the parking lot sideways in the patrol car hopped out with a nightstick, like ready to go to town. And the irony to that was um, my father, he would moonlight 
in Dryden was a small hamlet um, suburb to uh, to Ithaca as a patrol officer part time, and Bobby Day was his police chief in Dryden. And fast forward to '96, Bobby Day was my fire chief when I volunteered at Cuga Heights. Right. And I feel so bad for that man to have to be the chief of the both of us. That's uh, he did yeah. it that, long that's story. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> you recently were promoted to assistant chief. I was. I'm, uh, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm the fire. I've been promoted to assistant chief. I'm assigned to the fire prevention bureau. I'm currently shadowing the fire marshal, Jill Haynes Sharps, and she is going to retire in March. So to kind of get the lay of the land and how the job works, I'm shadowing her until March. And then at which point I'll become the fire marshal and the coach division. So I have to remember that there's an audience that doesn't know who you are. <laughs> so no, that's probably um, true. Yeah. <clears throat> That's a good point. Do, do a quick, do a quick bio <clears throat> where, where you work and all that stuff. Sure. Um, I work for the Ithaca Fire Department. I've been on the job since 2001. Uh, I've been a firefighter lieutenant and now an assistant chief. I have been a fire investigator for the fire department since 1998. And I'll get, I'll kind of explain that in a second. Um, I have certified code enforcement official. Um, I, uh, I'm a member of the hazmat team. So when I graduated high school in 94, I actually joined the Ithaca Fire Department as a bunker, which was a live-in student. So from 94 to 98, I was a student living in the fire station while I went to college. And during that time, I got my certification as a fire investigator in the state of the time. I took classes and I got put on the fire investigation team for the department. Um, and then got hired, finally hired in 2001 full time and started out as a firefighter, ironically, in the codes division, which we had just been formed. I spent three years in the codes division doing fire inspection. And I was also responsible for Knox box maintenance for the fire department as part of being a codes division. So I did fire inspections, mostly for public assemblies, uh, some of the fraternities and sororities on campus and any of the commercial buildings. And now I'm kind of gone full circle. And now I'm in the back in the coach division as the assistant chief slash fire marshal. And, you know, but I've dabbled in other things. I've been an emergency medical technician as required for the job, but I've worked for three different ambulance agencies um, part time. Um, I also have done fire inspection for one of the local, a couple of the local villages here on the side, uh, doing multiple residence inspections as well as public assembly inspections and business inspections. Um, it seems like the, the most natural possible progression moving up into, into free bugle status is, is to be in, in code enforcement and codes and whatnot. Um, and part of that responsibility of codes is fire investigation, cause and origin investigation, right? Yeah, for our department, the Fire Prevention Bureau does house the fire investigation team. So I will ultimately, you know, I will supervise the fire investigation team. So <clears throat> we talk, uh, we talk a bunch of different things. Active shooter is a, is a, is a common theme. Um, mm -hmm. However, we, we look at Asher and we're talking about um, the active shooter hostile event. Right. The response. Um, yep. I think we, we've we covered that in, in in a lot of detail. It's 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 pretty popular, but you know the normal everyday scenes of violence is is something that's pretty um, pretty important to me. And it's what a lot of what the foundation of things was um, in in writing and, and presenting and whatnot. Um, mm -hmm. You had you had a rather uh, unique experience, especially for for you know, fire investigation, not arson, not with a legal authority 
to make arrests and things like that because some of the marshals and fire marshals in the country, they have police powers, they carry firearms. Right. That's, that's not what you guys do. Right. Um, but you had a fire in, in association with a homicide and you had to do the investigation and, and testify in court. Yeah, we had a, a fire investigation that we were called for uh, an individual had set a fire um, in relation to trying to cover a crime. And it had been found out that he had uh, murdered his girlfriend. And uh, what's tricky for us at the time was we hadn't had a fire with a death like that before where we had competing agencies. So there was, you know, while we all worked together and it worked out in the end, there was some, a little bit of bumps in the road at the beginning while we figured out, okay, well, the fire department's here and they have, you know, exigent and circumstances they are doing cause and origin, which is allowed in New York state under the general municipal law. But we also are sensitive to the fact that there's another crime here. So we uh, just held the scene with the state police until they could get their crime scene techs there. And then we worked with their crime scene techs who did, you know, uh, helped us do crime scene investigation as well as cause and origin. And that actually made things a little cleaner because they collected all the evidence and submitted all the evidence versus me collecting evidence and then establishing a chain of command and then our chain of custody and then going to the police. So it worked well, but it, it had just had been something we tried before and uh, it acquired a lot of patience and a lot of communication. But I think in the end it worked out well, we did get the state police were able to convict this person and testifying in court was not something as an investigator we had done in a long time. So I didn't even have any mentors to say, Hey, you know, how do I do this? What do I testify with it? I know we had actually had to lean on dad a little bit to say, I got to go to court. What am I going to, you know, what do I do? And he was very helpful. I mean, obviously he had testified lots of times and that kind of knowledge, but you know, as we start to try to have succession planning, we don't have a lot of resources to train new fire investigators besides, you know, obviously the classes, national fire Academy, state fire Academy, those things, but you know, to, be able to talk to somebody who's testified in court, you know, we just don't have that background. Yeah. And, uh, we're not going to do the, uh, we're not going to do the tears and the crying thing, uh, as much as humanly possible. Unfortunately, um, we lost dad in 2013, but I can, I can unequivocally say with the shadow of a doubt, um, the level of pride that he had for you when you went through that and testifying was just, um, I remember him calling me on the phone and he was just beaming. Um, he was well, so thank proud. Thank you for that. That was nice. Yeah, thank that, you. Uh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Moving on. Um, <clears throat> so arson it's an index crime. It's an index crime that's reported into the FBI. And, and yep. it is, there's a lot of times where fire is, 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 is put in conjunction with other things like the case that you had, um, mm -hmm. where, where one is using fire in which to cover up a crime. And it actually, uh, it's an important aspect of, of violent scene response is crime scene preservation. And yes. that aspect of that proves for that particular case proved intent. Yes. And then that intent is able to enhance the charges. Yeah. So you can't articulate um, crime of passion. You can't articulate voluntary Correct. manslaughter with, with intent. So right. um, where it appears like the fire aspect of it is not associated to the to the other crimes, it it absolutely is, and in great uh, in in great what detail, I guess that it, it it allows you to enhance charges, and 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 many times it allows you to make um, arrests or to make a detention of of an individual based on that crime while you pursue other things. So um, I'm. I think it's super important that you treat a, a scene of, a, of an incendiary fire 
Um, I know arson. We say arson. That's really a charge. That's really a criminal, a criminal act. Incendiary means what? Well, incendiary, you know, by definition, and I'll butcher it, but it, it, the basics and layman's terms, it, it's an intentionally, it's an intentional act. It's an intentionally set fire. It means that you know somebody has intentionally set a fire. Right. So you can have an incendiary fire and not and and not have arson. It Correct. Depends. It's statutorily. Right. Arson is a, a char as a criminal charge. Incendiary is just describes the act. Right. So yeah. in some in some municipalities, you know, if you burn a uh, if you intentionally set a mattress on fire in your front lawn, that's arson. It might be a much lower degree, but that's arson. And in others, it requires structural damage of major structural components load bearing walls, things like that. There has to be damage to the structure in order for it to be arson. So it, it varies, but um, it's, it's important that you, you, you take care of those types of things. Um, so you, obviously Cornell university is very rooted in our family and, it, and it's in your guys's jurisdiction. Uh, it's been in the news obviously of recent of, of late with the, you know, the, the, the war with Israel and Hamas, um, some of the anti-Semitic things, there is a, uh, I would say a rich history with uh, Cornell and let's just call it civil unrest um, mm -hmm. where you have protesters and there are there are times where those protests can turn into can turn into other things, um, can turn into violence. And, you know, like we said in the beginning with dad, um, that's that's absolutely, you know, a, a, a concern or a situation that you could find yourself. Sure. In. Yeah. Um, I know. Uh, well, we guys have had circumstances where protesters will use devices in order to stage a sit-in. Um, mm -hmm. I know that there's a, there is an entire course that one can go through that is all about the different um, devices that protesters will use. Some of them are, are, are drums with concrete in them. Some of them are long tubes where they put their hand in and there's a chain that runs through oh, it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and how to defeat all those things. Um, well, in the tennis protest where they glued themselves to the chairs, that was just happened at the U.S. Open. Yeah, that kind of thing. So um, that and in, in, in association with uh, um, some of the ways to deal with uh, protesters or when you, when you have to remove them, um, mm -hmm. like in the 80s when they had the shanty towns, when they were protesting apartheid. Yeah, yep. And they had to clear that out. Um, right. What's your thoughts with uh, with with a department trying to prep and prepare for that, both from a, a, a pre planning standpoint and, mm -hmm. and from a an operational standpoint? Like, what's how do you go about trying to deal with that? Well, I know that the the police and uh, have been. Um, fairly proactive in contacting us about these things, letting us know when they happen so that we can come up with a plan. You know, as a department, you know, we have 11 firefighters and is our minimum. So, you know, that's two firefighters, that's two firefighters on an apparatus, except for two pieces, which have lieutenants on them and then an assistant chief. So our, our manpower is not mighty. So we have to kind of be creative about how we're going to respond to these kinds of events. So, Normally, what we have tried in the past is we'll send a single engine with the firefighter and a lieutenant to kind of stage in the area and see what resources they need, contact the police, set up a command post. And those are our steps to try to, to, try to pre-plan those things. Now, be, normally, these protests are in certain areas. So because there's a, a history, like you had said, we kind of have an idea about where we're going to stage. All right, we're going to stage an apparatus here. We're going to stage an apparatus there. And uh, Cornell has, you know, their environmental health and safety officers who are trained in their um, to do first response. You know, they have keys, they can read panels, they know the building layouts. 
So a lot of times we'll start liaising with them first. Okay, where are they in the building? You know, is there fire protection stuff in place? And then after that, you start to develop a plan. Okay, how many resources do we need? Do I need the whole department up here? Where are we going to go from there? Can we even get the trucks in there? Is it safe to? So the pre-planning piece, Cornell has been very, very good along with the police department and getting with us. And we just, we decide, okay, this event, this is how we're going to respond. Um, that's good to hear that there's that, that coordination of, uh, Mm -hmm. of entities because you've got a lot of different stakeholders and a lot of different agencies. Um, you know, Cornell University, they, they have their own law enforcement um, agency for mm -hmm. the jurisdiction uh, of, of Cornell. But then you have county, sheriff's department, you have state police, you have uh, the city police department, um, neighboring Cuga Heights, there's there's a multiple law enforcement entities that border and touch the university. So your your the 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 likelihood that you're going to deal with multiple different agencies um, is is probably pretty high if it goes into in, into a you know a circumstance that requires that type of exigent response from multiple right. law enforcement plus you guys and then yeah. you know. The outlying uh, fire and EMS agencies um, from different areas within within the county is likely um, also. So getting there ahead of time, identifying, you know, oneself within the command structure, being in that moment, that that that's that's pretty critical to the rest of the way the event or, or the incident is going to go. I mean, I can imagine the chaos of all of those agencies trying to descend upon an incident scene um, in the immediate where you would have a protest of, of, of something like when they took the, took over day hall, I think in the sixties mm -hmm. or seventies. Um, yeah. And, I mean, and they've done it a, a, quite a few times. It has, it's been a, a standard move, but I, I think at this point, you know, they have developed every time that happens, they develop a new procedure. You know, Cornell is very proactive and we are as well as our city in, in, in the emergency um, area, as far as, you know, all the events have an IAP, they all have an incident command, they all have a command post, they all have a dedicated radio. So those IAPs are usually available pretty quick in the process. So we can look at it and say, all right, well, yeah, we can absolutely do this or, you know, actually, this is wrong. We're not going to be able to do this today. Yeah, we, we need more resources in order, in right. order to accomplish right. this, whatever it may be. Yeah. yeah. Um, you also have Ithaca College, so it's not, mm -hmm. you know, Cornell's not the only, um, not the only school in town. Um, right. Cornell's pretty big. What is there, like 25,000 students somewhere in the neighborhood of that? Or twenty thousand, twenty five thousand personnel. Yeah, I would, I would have to look it up, but they, they the uh, always a safe bet is they double our population when they're in town, so they double the population of the city with the students and the staff. Um, so you can imagine, you know, like on the army base, if you had double the soldiers there, I mean, that's that's a lot. You're talking about a lot of people that you have to serve. So, um, you know. Everybody would tell you is, you know, we can, we get a spike in, you know, September and we get a spike again. And right now in February, when the students, you know, return and they come back and, you know, a lot of times, you know, we can anticipate this stuff that's going to happen and we can adjust for it, but it's, it's a lot to deal with. It's a lot of very different calls. So when we do get these special events, we really do count on that planning to make sure that we're prepared. Yeah, and the uh, some of the uniqueness of uh, some of the uniqueness of 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 what the university encounters or, or or has that that emergency services needs to deal with. Um, one could say is groundbreaking. I know that uh, Cornell was one of the first. I wanted to say first. Uh, but Frank Ricci uh, 
corrected me on that. Um, right. Apparently, Yale was the first uh, was the first college to have armed law enforcement. Uh, okay. But after the A Hall incident, I think Cornell was pretty pretty close behind them, um, mm-hmm. where they had their own organized armed law enforcement um, agency assigned to the school um, mm-hmm. as an entity within the school. Um, but you know the 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 apartheid protests um, when they built the shanties out on uh, the art squad yep. that that was national news um, at the time mm-hmm. that was rather sensitive. Now we're dealing with the you know the the war overseas in the Middle East and some of the news coverage that 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 has produced. Um, that's that's got to cause some. Uh, it's got to cause some some concerns for what type of organize, organized things you're going to have, um, and that media attention is that going to draw both sides of the spectrum for the argument, both the left left wing, right wing type of uh, uh, individuals that that want to cause some some harm or yeah. havoc. Yeah. Um, and you guys have the vet school that's that's grabbed some attention in the past from some organized groups. Um, mm-hmm. There's, there, there's a lot. Um, there's a whole lot. And uh, over the years, uh, you know, along with, unfortunately, many other, you know, cities in America, there's, you know, there's an uptick in crime. Um, I know that the, the area is not like it was when, when you know, when we were in high school. So, um dealing with with that kind of stuff on it on the daily i mean you guys you guys you guys stay pretty busy uh, going to stuff on the daily um yeah you do for sure the uh how do you uh how do you as a command staff start to try to identify what needs to be done what how you need to tweak policies, procedures, resource packaging, that kind of stuff in conjunction or just internally. Um, what does that look like? And then once you, you kind of have an idea, what, how do you communicate with the, with the other agencies that are around you? Well, we're, we're in a bit of a transition period. Uh, you know, I just was promoted two weeks ago. The fire chief, you know, as was just appointed um, within the last couple of years, we have a new deputy chief that was just appointed at the end of the year last year. So we have a new police chief. So we're actually revisiting a lot of these things because now we have new partners, we have new players. And what we're, you know, what we're working out, we have a Lieutenant um, Nick Raponi who's um, got a degree in emergency management and he's been working with these community partners to develop new plans for active shooter. You know, we have, discuss tactical withdrawal policies. We have, you know, we're working with the county 911 center right now to develop better systems for plain language use and for allowing, you know, safety. Because what we're finding is, you know, as you said, as we get busier, you know, the resources start to stretch. Now we're trying to pull resources from outside the county who may have never been in the city before or don't come very often. So we need to be able to have a consistent policies and procedures that we can pass on to them so that they're, you know, we're all on the same page. And um, in my previous role, I was directly involved in policy and procedure development for the fire chief. You know, I helped uh, just edit and write. And then, you know, as things would come up and he would ask me to, you know, do we have a policy on this or do we have a procedure? You know, I would look through our system and say, yeah, we do. That Here's what it says. And then we would pass those policies on to local law enforcement and the ambulance services, you know, any other first responders to really to figure out, is this really going to work? What do we need to tweak with it? And I think our communication between those agencies gets better every day. And you can just see it and it, you see it in the street more than anything. You start to see, you hear less radio chatter because you don't need to have it anymore because everybody knows what they're going to do. And you also start to see uh, more and more calls that are handled with less repercussions. So less calls to the chief's office, less meetings. And, you know, we're still doing a lot of hot washes on a calls just because there's always something to get better. But 
we're not seeing calls where you come back and you're like, ooh, that didn't go well. Like we really messed that up. So I think as we keep, you know, having new management and leadership, we're just going to keep getting better for sure. Um, that's cool. That that's great that you have that. Um, that that's where you are as an agency. It's an exciting place. It's an exciting place to be. Um, yeah, it definitely is. Yeah, I've I've been uh, I've been a part of probably a handful of of time periods where that is occurring, where you have um, a change in direction or a change in in, in leadership or a change in um, culture, and that. It really is an exciting time um, when you're when you have the opportunity to change culture in a positive way, command culture, um, station culture, uh, department culture. It's it's uh, it's really a, it's really a good thing. Um, as somebody who started out, you know, in codes, code enforcement, mm -hmm. fire prevention, then the floor, and then working your way back there now. Um, I've always been a, I've always been a believer that anybody who, who gets to do that role is that much more effective at an, when an emergency occurs, because you, you have particular knowledge about different buildings, different occupancies, different footprints, you know, where, you know, certain nuances are where, where this particular building will you know, this exit door sticks or, you know, this, this elevator is kind of a little wonky. Um, you know, the, the smoke, this building has a smoke removal system, uh, things like that, things that, that are part of your daily that, um, you do as, as, as a job in, in prevention, then transferring that to the floor, like, well, where, where's the FDC? We're looking for the FDC sign. Oh, the FDC is around the back just because you know that it is because it's right. part of your, your function. Yeah. From, from a active shooter, um, Asher standpoint, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that aspect of somebody in, in, in that part of the profession and what they can bring to the table when we're having discussions about pre preparation and, and pre-planning for, these events. Yeah. I think that knowledge is so priceless. I mean, you, you, when you go to these bigger buildings, you know, let's say schools and stuff, you know, we, we walk through them, you know, especially Cornell, like we're doing inspections every year. So Cornell is a big campus. They have a lot of buildings, but you know, when you start to walk them all the time, then you start to get the layout in your mind and then you start to figure out how the systems work. And then when you, go into that planning mode, what I find a lot of time is just the people who are doing the planning may not have been in the building. So they start out with a generic plan because that's what they're used to. And then you're like, actually, you can't put your command post in the basement because there's only one way in and one way out. And you're not going to have any radio signal because I was just down there the other day. So those kind of small things are helpful. The other thing that's helpful is, you know, how the fire control systems work. So you know, if you have having that knowledge says, all right, well, we're not going to be able to shut the fire alarm system down because as soon as we do that, we're going to lose these HVAC components or these HVAC components are going to turn this way. So we have to figure out a way to be able to address those systems because some buildings you can and some of the older buildings you can't, um, you know, especially when you're talking about restaurants too, when you have restaurants that have, you know, one way in because they're less than 50 people, but on the backside, they have a kitchen exit, you know, those firefighters know, well, yeah, you can, maybe can't get in through that door, but there's like a back kitchen that joins with this hallway that you can get in from this other business. So that kind of knowledge I think is huge. And when I came from codes and went back on the line, there was a lot of buildings I went to where, you know, I said, oh yeah, the fire alarm panel is over here. And, you know, the people on the line, that may have been the first time they saw that building in five years or six years where I just saw it, you know, I just saw it every year or I was in it every other year. Yeah. I remember we had a, we had a conversation about that when you, you first got detailed and going over the codes and I'm like, seems like it sucks, but it's going to really, it's really going to put you in a good way when you come out and you go back and you go out onto the floor. Um, 
because of that extra knowledge. Um, super important when we're talking about, you know, active shooter and you got to, you get, you got a lot of patience that you need to get out and you're talking about trying to establish, you know, loading zones for ambulances or casualty collection points and things like that. Um, that back door, that back door access, that could prove to be ridiculously valuable in moving to and fro. Um, we've, we've discussed, uh, before on the show about, uh, pre-planning for these events. And when you do so, if you're able to, it's a really good idea to get a representative from fire a representative from law enforcement, a representative from EMS to walk a building when you're doing pre-planning from an Asher standpoint. Um, you know, you may be able to, to articulate that a particular door, the way the door is, is constructed or, right. um, you know, taking a, you know, a paint roller, you know, with the, with the wiring removed, I can slip it between two doors and hit the pan of hardware and open the door. Yeah. Um, you know, not to, not to knock the profession because I did both, but it, it, it's kind of like one of the memes where you're like trying to, you know, pull a door you're supposed to push. It's if right. forceful entry is our bread and butter, it's something that we know there's, there's also non-destructive forceful entry that is quick and simple and easy Right. And being able to articulate that in the moment to to a cop is that could be that could be priceless when when an incident occurs. So being able to walk the building and look at it from from the perspective of your discipline, and then compare and share notes, you you're starting to formulate a a, a multi agency multi disciplined approach or 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 plan to yeah. be able to to be able to prepare for an event at that particular location. And mm -hmm. a lot of that is predictable. Like, you, is. You said like Cornell, there are particular buildings and locations that are important to the university or totally an important aspect that is, that gets a greater amount of attention from aggravators and aggressors, let's mm -hmm. say. So developing a pre-plan, an all hazard type violent scene response pre-plan from a multidisciplined approach, it's not it's not that hard. Um I think the I think probably the hardest part will be getting the stakeholders there at the same time, in the same place to to accomplish that. Yeah, I think part of that is just manpower. It's just strictly because, as you know, in your job, no longer are we, you know, just what our badge says or just what our title says. You know, we are doing, you know, four or five different jobs now because we don't have the manpower. You know, if, you know, when I got promoted to assistant chief, you know, that took a fire investigator away, so to speak, from the line because now I'm the supervisor and so now I have two fire investigators and, a, and a, an apprentice instead of three fire investigators and that's not even enough but if you look at some of the police departments you know with their turnover because we have had a lot of retirees they haven't had any chance to send anybody to training to do their regular job and you're asking them to do their regular job and then hey do this other thing because that's what you used to do and nobody else can do it you know, those kinds of, so when you're trying to get partners together for a meeting, I think a lot of times that's a bigger problem is there's just, there's no partners to have. They just, they're so busy that, you know, trying to plan these things is really tough to do. And I think we're now getting to a point where we're starting to put a focus on that planning piece. You know, we're developing software that's going to do pre-planning. You know, and the fire inspectors are going to help with that a little bit. You know, they're going to be able to gather some of that data. And we share as much information as we can with the county 911 center, you know, with other partners, especially hazards. You know, we'll try to get hazard notification out right away. Like, hey, don't go near this building or this is the experience we had in this building because we, even if you can't plan for it necessarily about how you respond, if you know the hazard is there, that's half the battle. And as soon as we know that the hazard is there. 
you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, educational buildings, especially like Cornell has a lot of different labs in it and, you know, doing inspections there and talking, being partners with Cornell, we can identify lab hazards before we respond there. So if we do respond to a fire, I can tell the ship that's going, hey, just so you're aware, this lab, you know, does this kind of research, be careful. And Cornell is very good about that. They always have the lab staff there so they can tell us what's going on in there. But I, I think you're right. Getting that meeting is critical. It's just really tough to do with short staffing and you end up baby stepping it. And I think that's a large part of what we're doing now is instead of trying to tackle the whole project and say, all right, we're going to meet at you know this building and we're going to go to the floor to see it. You might say, all right, today we're going to talk about, you know, what are we going to do on the first floor? We're going to walk the first floor. And then you might be a month and then right, now we're going to go to the second floor on this month. So I think what you're seeing now is we're trying to just, you know, take little bites of the apple at a time so we can come up with that whole piece. Yeah. I, to be careful so that I'm not uh, saying something that I shouldn't. Um, okay. We, we, we have established what we would call an Asher working group where yeah. we, where we meet cyclically um, represented okay. from stakeholders yep. and we discuss aspects related to Asher mm -hmm. and various different things associated with that. Um, there's this thing that we, we refer to as OPSEC. <laughs> so okay. I'm trying to be careful as not to, not to violate any of that. Um, right. But we, we meet monthly. I get your point. You're meeting monthly, yeah. Right. Yeah. right. <clears throat> yep. We meet monthly. We look at uh, we look at things and we develop, you know, plans based on conversations, based on site visits, based on things like that. Um, right. And it's, it's proven very valuable um, and it is, it is directly associated with a change in attitude and culture associated with that preparation piece, um, yeah. things, things are very different, um, as, as a result of that. And okay. yeah, of course the NFPA 3000 has, has been a theme on the show for obvious reasons because a uh, sure. technical committee member. Um, yeah. but one of the, one of the things in there is, is the rewrite, which will be coming out is discusses the formulation of, of, of an Asher, working group and Asher and Asher committee and how that's, how that's managed and worked. Um, and it's that putting, putting people at the table, um, to have the discussion. If we can get everybody in a room, uh, that's a win in, in, you know, so I think it's good to, uh, I think it's good to, to identify that and to see that, that where you guys currently are and seeing, um, opportunities or as at least, as you've articulated opportunities in which to, to turn towards uh, more of a preventive preparation type of, of mindset is, is a really, is a really good place to be as far as, uh, as far as dealing with what, what is to come because this stuff's not going to go away. It's if anything, it's probably going to get worse. Yeah. It's not going to go away. And you just, the, the thing that, as hard as the patience piece because you you know you, you just have you know as i'm finding you just if we can get a little progress forward every day then it'll get done it, you know what and that's the toughest part is being patient and trying to do all right we didn't get it all done today but we got to this part let's try to get to this part later because you're if you try to if we're trying to tackle it that's where i have find in the past like we'll get a big working group together we'll start working on a project but we've tried to bite off so much that when we meet again we're just, we're just short we just haven't really obtained anything so i think what you're seeing now is you're seeing these you know as we have this change in leadership they're recognizing you know like you know, this lieutenant is good at emergency management. I'm going to give him these tasks and he's going to reach out to counterparts and, you know, he's going to start to develop plan. And then when you do have that big meeting, kind of all the grunt works out of the way. They've already hashed this out. They've already hashed that out. And you 
end up giving to the big working group, this is what we've created. What do you guys think? And I think that is more successful. I think that takes, I think that takes really a, this big mountain of a problem and it just makes it manageable. Sure. Um, yeah. It, it, it's, it's so, it sounds so common sense oriented that it makes you scratch your head as to why it's been so difficult or complicated to get to that point of yeah. being able to do that. Um, but I, I think COVID I helped us, honestly. I think COVID helped us with that because you see more Zoom meetings. And I think you see more Zoom meetings as people are figuring out if we, if we can, if you have a half hour Zoom meeting versus an hour meeting in person, I think the half hour Zoom meeting, you get a lot more done. I really do. I think those half hour quick, you know, half hours, because I think you're more likely to get all the partners in on a half hour Zoom meeting where they don't have to travel, they don't have to park, you know, all those little things that make an hour meeting a two hour meeting. If they can do a quick down and dirty Zoom meeting, I think that is a lot more productive. And I think that's what you found with, um, you know, COVID when we started doing a lot more of these Zoom meetings and these online meetings. I think. You know, now what we're trying to to get away from, though, is that it can't just be a Zoom meeting. At some point, you have to sit across the room from somebody, shake their hand, and say, "This is what we're going to do today." Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the technology is a uh, technology is a hell of a thing. There's a uh, it's created uh, opportunities to do um, so much and and bring us closer together. It's 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 kind of odd that social media would be used in in the intent that it was that the intent in which it was designed and stuff, you know, um, I think, uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's great that again, that you, where you guys are is, is recognizing, uh, and monopolizing on opportunities for cultural change within, within, you know, the, the disciplines within, you know, uh, uh the response partners, and being able to to monopolize on that and say, what what can we do? How can we work um, together? And how can we solidify a relationship that already exists, but but make it that much that much more um, stronger? You know. And um, one of the things that we've um, talked about in great detail here is. Um, an uncomfortable subject for a lot of people in fire and EMS. And I understand totally it's the use, it's, it's the use and deployment of body armor uh, or, or ballistic protection. So, <clears throat> um, you know, we, we, we've discussed the, the application and, and use of ballistic protection, not just for active shooter, but just to have it. And then and then the, the proper utilization of it on violent scene response and, and it being able to have it not necessarily from a standpoint of, of active shooter, although it's great because, you know, you're able, you're able to access it at that, that point. Um, what uh, is that? Uh, is that something that you, you think is, is, is a good thing to pursue within, within this fire service now, or what, what, are, what are your thoughts on ballistic protection being on apparatus? You know, I, being a small department, there's very rarely do we buy a tool that does one job. Like when we look at buying tools and equipment for our department, we're looking at something that's going to do multiple jobs. It's not just going to do one job. And when you talk about ballistic armor, you know, knock on wood, you know, we haven't we haven't had incidents necessarily where the firefighters have been put in that way. And that's through policy and procedure. You know, we have a very, you know, we have policies and procedures in place that put our firefighters in a safe zone until the police are able to tell us. And um, you know, I think as the technology gets better, you know, the body armor gets lighter. You know, we have, we adapt it for the fire service. I think it's, it's definitely a tool to consider. I just think for a small department like us to invest in body armor for all our firefighters is a big ask. 
And we have, I don't think we're at a point yet where we can do that. So what we, what we have talked about and what our lieutenant is doing now is he's doing research to figure out, all right, so what if we did kits for on-duty staff? So maybe we don't supply every firefighter with them, but maybe we have a kit that we use when we respond to scenes of violence, whether it's on an engine or it's in the staff car for the assistant chief, and then we can deploy it. So that's where we are at. You know, I personally think that we need to be careful because you want to have a lot of training and education because as you know, it's not, it's not, you know, you don't put on this bulletproof vest and all of a sudden you're invincible. That's not how it works. And, you know, I hate to, I hate to put, you know, people in that particular set of safety gear because that's what we need to call. We need to think of it as safety gear. Yeah. It's and, PPE. Right. It's PPE and PPE has requirements and PPE is used for specific things. And I think if we looked at it from that PPE perspective and we started treating it that way, I think, you know, having a kit or two available for our firefighters and working with our police partners to, for them, for their input, because, you know, they, they're going to want to know, you know, all right, well, you guys have this gear, you know, does that mean we put you into this role? You know, do we put you warm instead of cold? You know, do we put you hot instead of cold? You know, that's, you know, that's a conversation you need to have with your partners. Because if they're going to say, I don't care if you're driving up in a tank, we're never going to put you in a warm or hot zone. Does that mean, you know, that you bought that gear for, you know, does that mean you've wasted money for that PPE or is, you know. So I think once you figure out, all right, we're going to treat it as PPE, we're going to have it for these scenarios. Then you can look at costs and we can see if it's really something we're going to be able to do. Yeah, I, I think R&D is an important aspect to to acquisition of, of, well, I guess what we're calling BPE, ballistic protective equipment. Um, yeah. It's part of a PPE ensemble. I, right. I, I think R&D is, is, is huge. Um, yeah. There's a... How long does it take to build a fire truck? You know, how long do we do... Right. Right. How long yeah. do we do research for that? But I know I've seen people do it. Well, they go online and they go, bye. And they, yeah. they, they get to ballistic armor or they get a bulletproof vest without doing any research or testing. And like, this literally is designed to stop a bullet from killing you. And you spent 30 seconds on Amazon buying it. You know, the fire truck, <laughs> which we drive all the time, you know, we spend years specking, testing, you know, so I, I think the same approach has to be done for that BPE. We got to really do our research. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, yeah, I think, uh, well, as an example, there's uh, the NFPA standard um, articulates that you need level 3A ballistic protection. And that okay. by the, the NIJ standards and how that looks, is that's soft armor. Okay. So that's soft pliable armor. Um, right. You know, not not to get into a ballistics class, but if you get shot with a rifle in soft armor, it's going to go through. It's going to go through one end and one the other. The other. Um, right. And you know, shameless plug to my to my training video responding to scenes of violence. We actually there's a section in that where we talk about that, um, mm -hmm. and we shot. We shot body armor with a high-speed camera so we could actually show the bullet on right. each side. As is it, it a shameless plug if it's your show? I don't think it's a shameless plug. If it's I mean, show. yeah, I guess that's fair. Um, yeah. So it. So if I had a video, that would be a shameless plug. We can't do that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, um, sure. That particular um, that particular set of of VPE as as NFPA three thousand articulates is the minimum. And of course, you're allowed to exceed the standard. The standard, yeah. But can you think of another standard that is readily exceeded by choice? Right. It, 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 yeah. So then you go down the rabbit hole of NFPA where, like, we exceeded the standard here. We didn't do shit with the one over here. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Um, you know, and how does that look? You know, if somebody gets hurt, you know how that looks, how they're going to they're gonna take that apart. So, so, and, and, and there's, 
there are certain sizing things associated with with soft armor. Um, okay. There's, you know, it usually you measure somebody from, you know, their sternal notch to, to just above their navel. And, okay. and that's obviously unique from, from where to where, you right. know, just our, our bunker gear. It's right. not like, oh, okay, I wear a large. <laughs> you know, you go to a closet, and grab a large, and throw it at him. Here's your coat. It's a large. Um, right. Which is how it used to happen to us. Like, here's the leftover turnout gear. As long as it covers your ankles and you can, you know, your hands are, your arms are covered, you're good to go. Yep. You know, fit wasn't really a thing, but you can't do that with this stuff. Yeah, just put the stuff on, like lift your arms up. Okay, right. I can't see your wrist. Okay, get on your knees. Okay, I can't see you. You're good. Right. Um, yeah. That if, if your manufacturer's recommendations say that it has to be measured to the wearer, which yep. is generally in fine print, you better be purchasing stuff that says it's measured to the wearer. Right. Um, in contrast to that is ballistic plating. So, so plates right. that generally come in three different sizes. There can be four, it just, it varies. But what we're mm-hmm. talking about is, is uh, 14 by 11, okay. uh, 10 by eight uh, and eight by six. So the plate Similarly, you want it to cover basically your lungs and your heart, right? And and, and, yeah. and your your aorta, right? And, you know, ma- major vessels. Mm-hmm. That that's what you want it to cover. Um, right. It's not going to keep you from out. getting wounded. It's going to keep you from dying, essentially. Basically, yeah, yeah. Because I mean, you can wear a vest. It doesn't shot. It doesn't stop you from getting shot in the leg, right? It doesn't shot stop you from getting shot in the arm. Yeah. Um, it's it's. It's not designed for that. So yeah. you get the, the ballistic steel plates. Generally, the shelf life for those is like at least 10 years. Mm-hmm. Um, some soft armor is five. So you're talking about, you know, imagine a, a typical 20-year career. Right. Buying four sets of ballistic protection for you throughout that throughout that time frame. Yeah. And versus two. Right. Um, you get a carrier. You you, yep. you get a, a stack of plates. You get X amount of large. You get X amount of extra large. You get X amount. Okay. And what what the major cost is is the plates. Right. The the less cost is the is the carrier. carrier so right. for 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 an agency that has the ability to outfit their their members with it, with their own carrier, you can set it to what you want. And when you come to work, sure. you stick the plate in. Um, okay. the, way to, the way to look at it is, is, is like your SCBA. Mm-hmm. So your plates is the air pack. Um, your carrier is your mask. Okay. So I issue you a mask, uh, but your air pack's on the truck. Right. Right. So I can issue you a carrier and your okay. plates are on the truck. And the cost profile for that is generally lower. Um, and, and, where there's there is a requirement of you know the steel plate with the anti spall coating is a uh, is a ten year shelf life. It's steel. Okay. Steel doesn't expire. Right. The anti spall coating, the the little rhino lining stuff over it, that may um, that may degrade over ten. Years. I'd argue that I'm wearing a plate carrier. So that anti-spall coating, the plate carrier is going to serve that capacity of preventing that spalling. Um, I would be, I would absolutely be comfortable with with having steel plates that, on visual inspection, are fine. Ten year shelf life, and, and then some. Um, I know the sheriff's department, my sheriff's department, did um, did testing at the ranges of of ballistic protection that had far exceeded. Um, far exceeded ex- expiration date. Yeah, and it it performed fine. Uh, that's not by and large to say everything, but um, I think that there are, and I can't name manufacturers unfortunately. There there are there are manufacturers out there that a steel plate front and back, a simple mesh carrier, fourteen pounds total, fifteen pounds total, five six hundred bucks. And that, that's a lot more manageable, especially when the plates can be used interchangeably with other people. 
Um, that's a lot more manageable than some of the other um, ballistic platforms. So, um, and I'd much rather have a steel plate that will stop all kinds of different ballistic rounds mm -hmm. and have to worry about, okay, my vest will stop, you know, a 40 and a nine, but it's not going to stop a 44 or it'll right. stop all the handgun rounds. But if somebody's got a rifle, I'm kind of yeah. shit. Right. that type of thing so yeah. i just just go go for the max uh especially if it's cheaper um but that's yeah. just there are many different ways and in the, in the, in the things that you said about you know putting it on a, on a, on a command vehicle uh right. putting it on a, a, an apparatus putting it on a particular apparatus right where a truck company or a rescue company that's staffed all yeah. the time that that becomes a special operations response right. um we're doing that with our ladder truck. You know, we have a EV blanket for EV car fires. We put it on the ladder truck. Yeah. You know, so it, because, you know, small department, you know, if we get called to a car fire, you know, it's two engines usually, you know, but if the two engines get there and go, it's a Tesla. Well, now we're going to be there a lot longer. So call the truck out for two more firefighters and they bring the EV blanket. And I think it's the same thing. You just, it's a resource you can use when you need it. And you put it on that piece of apparatus, and that responds it. Yeah, there's 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 a lot of different ways to skin a cat. Um, yeah, and if you're starting off from scratch, it's um, like R and D is big. Um, right. There's a lot of companies that will provide you know samples and demos and things like that, um, yeah. and then figuring out you know the deployment aspect of it and then backing that up with policy and procedure right because if you have equipment and you don't have a procedure or a guideline i said policy i shouldn't have said that um if you don't have a, po a procedure or a guideline it, yeah, you don't want to put it in stone but you want to give them flexibility but you need a procedure so that they know where to turn to so they, right. they have a thought in their mindset that says all right well this you know, these, the procedure that we talked about, this, this scenario fits that procedure. So we should do, you know, A, B, and C. So, yeah, I, uh, our thing was, uh, procedures are, procedures are the chief or, or the chief's leadership giving you guidance when you can't speak to them. Right. When you can't, That's when you can't speak to them, yeah. what do you want to do? Um, a policy is unbreakable. Right. A policy is Sexual harassment is a policy. Violence in the workplace is a policy. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, substance abuse while on duty. That's a policy. There's yeah. no, there's no uh, ifs, ands, or buts about that. That's yeah. if you pick it. Right. There's no, well, that's okay. Well, yeah, we should deviate from that. No. Uh, right. The procedures and guidelines are, there. there's wiggle room. It's, yeah. I'm giving you your left and your rights. Under mm -hmm. most circumstances, however, there is always the the situation that wasn't thought of, the situation that the author that wrote the procedure couldn't possibly cover. Mm -hmm. um, when the chief signed it, it was like, "Yep, I'm signing it for for ABC." But you know, three years later, X Y Z happens, and what do you yeah. do? So. Um, yeah, I, but you got to have something. Yeah. You got to have something that dictates, um, especially for that, when and how you use it. Um, right. There's, there's great benefit to, to stepping off a truck and, and, and having body armor on and, and that command presence and what that looks like, you know, to, to, to people at the scene. Sure. And conversely, you don't want to look like a cop. In yeah, certain, that's that's what we talked about too. Is like you, you know your plate carrier because you've seen them, I've seen them. Mm -hmm. You know, we I've seen you know certain agencies they bike plate carriers, and if you're a bad speller, you can't tell the difference between police, fire, and EMS. That you just can't, you know. And that's been a big debate as we do research. Is like, you know, how do we, you know, do you add reflexite to it? Do you add, you know, what do you do to make it so it doesn't look like you're a member of law enforcement because if your event is targeting law enforcement, you know, that's where we want to try to stay away from that kind of situation. 
yeah, you want uh, you want it to be what it is without looking what it looking like what it is. Right. And there's there's a lot of different things out there. Um, some of them are pigeonholed though, and and that can that can cause a problem. But there's traffic safety vests that are ballistic carriers, and right. it's a traffic safety vest. Um, and that's the recommendation that I had given. You know, the lieutenant who's doing the research and the chief of training. I'm like. You know, we, we always have to have a traffic vest. So if we can have a traffic vest that you can add plates to, that's probably a direction we should look at because you're always going to have a traffic vest. And, you know, that's that concept I talked about earlier where it's hard for us to buy a tool that does one job. It's yep. easy for us to buy a tool that we can justify that does four or five different jobs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, uh, for, for the military um, personnel that, that go from that, career and then come over to the fire service or, or dually um, set within that. There's a lot of things like uh, blowout kits, um, IFAX, you know, the little okay. fanny pack with the medical stuff right. in it. That's awesome for you, yep. for yourself. Right. That's awesome for your battle buddy. Yep. In an active shooter environment where you're hopscotching from like 10 different patients, that's not so cool your kit gets destroyed pretty quick on your first patient reaching and grabbing things out of there with, with, you know, bodily fluids, and gloves. Yeah. You destroy your kit pretty quick. Um, and, and with the ballistic piece of it, it's, you gotta be careful looking that way. So you don't need, you don't need a, a plate carrier with a radio pouch and with, you know, all these different, you know, things, you don't need all that. Um, you know, we, when we first dove into that, we literally got a mesh carrier and mm-hmm. it, it's literally the, it, it looks like the material of, you know, those gym sneaker bags. Mm-hmm. So it breathes and right. it has a panel on it that says front that says fire and it's all Velcro. I can wear that under bunker gear. I can wear that in a level A suit. I can wear that in just about any environment because it breathes. Right. It breathes. It's not it's giant right. you know yeah looking tactical with your 511 tac you know uniform right. pants that are blue likely right. yeah. and the, you know the cop he's probably wearing the same damn pants yeah. you know it no one's yeah. going to look at your badge it's it it's yeah it's a problem so there but yeah. there's varying different ways that particular ballistic platform i can put anything over that i can put a coat over it. i can put I can put a traffic vest over it. I can, I can wear it in different, many different circumstances. Um, so that the product stuff is out there to meet the need. It's just, it's just looking for it and researching it and figuring it out. Um, yeah. The, and it the may, med- you may have to buy something. You may have to buy something and try it out and decide. Yeah. Yeah. This is not going to work. Yep. Um, and, 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 you know, the thing, the thing for us in this environment is to stay light and tactical. Sure. Light and tactical. I don't want to wear yeah. a 40 pound ballistic protection equipment or, or, or right. ensemble with the expectation that I'm going to be, you know, going up to the third floor, you like, you know, stairs, grabbing people and bringing them downstairs. Like how, realistically how many people do you think you can evacuate like that while we are wearing, you know, all of that, you know, how many, how many times do you think you're going in, in and out? And if you, if you're limited people that, that things, that's when things get, get, get really fun. So um, yeah. And the medical piece is the same thing. Like the equipment, do I issue everybody, um, you know, individual equipment, to be able to do, you know, uh, treatment or do I just pile everything into one kit, take the kit in there and we unpack it when we get in there. I mean, it, 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 it varies. You got, it's, it's something, it's something to look at. It's not an easy answer. Uh, uh, I think, uh, like I said, I think it's an, it, it's an exciting time. Um, if you're, if you're in a department that is, is, has had some, some turnover, has some new blood and, and not to say that the old blood, you know, um, what was negative in any way. Um, you just get fresh perspectives and there's new, there's new handshakes going on and, and there's the, the ability to, 
um, tackle some of these harder, harder circumstances that, that kind of linger in the back of our minds, I, I suppose. Um, we've hit the, uh, we're slightly exceeded the, uh, the, the one hour witching, witching hour that I, I try very, very hard to stay, to stay under that. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll wrap up in closing, uh, and give you, uh, the opportunity to drop a, a final, final word or, or, or nugget to things. Um, and as, we, as we, we sign off of this, um, I'd be remiss to not, uh, remind people of, you know, FDIC, um, the early registration discounts are, are going to go away in, in, I think about a month. Um, and, uh, if you are uh, a veteran, you get a discount. If you're associated with the military, you get a discount. If you are a federal firefighter, uh, military firefighter, you get a discount. Um, so don't don't miss those opportunities. Um, this it's very kind of 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 Clarion to to allow for that. So don't don't miss don't miss your opportunities to do that. Um, so, and, and yes, I'm teaching at FDIC. I'll be out, uh, on Monday, um, teaching active shooter pre-planning the response, uh, Monday at eight. And, uh, it's a four hour workshop. I highly encourage, uh, anyone interested in, uh, in, in hearing some more of me ramble about stuff like this. Uh, please feel free to, free to come out and say hi. Um, but again, thank you so much for, uh, for participating. I think it's, uh, I think it's great to, uh, to have you on the show. It's a great legacy of our family in, in emergency services and, and super proud of you and what you've done. Um, and, and your promotion to assistant chief, I think it's, uh, well-deserved, um, probably a little late, but that's older regime. Um, <laughs> can't really bag on, on people for that. Uh, but, um, again, I'll leave you with the last word. Well, I think I really appreciate you having me on. I think the work that you're doing is very important and, you know, obviously, you know, again, not to invoke tears, but I know that, you know, our father was very proud of you and, you know, I'm certainly very proud of you. I have, you know, spoken very highly of you to anybody who's active asked or is researching this kind of stuff. You know, my first, phone call is always to you for this kind of stuff, you know, and as we rebuild, you've been very helpful in information so I can pass that on to our partners and just give everybody a perspective. And, you know, from my perspective as a new fire prevention chief, you know, I will be working closely with those partners to make sure that, you know, what we do is going to still be safe for building occupants. It's going to be safe for our community. And I think with our new leadership in the city, you know, we have a new city manager, we have a new police chief, we have a new deputy fire chief. All those partners are are really anxious to make the city a better place. And I look forward to being a part of that team. Um, I hope to uh, be on your show again. We can re we can circle back in a year and see how our progress is. Absolutely. Um, and thank you. Uh, yeah, you're welcome to come on anytime you want. And, and I think it'd be, uh, I think it's a, it's beyond an honor to have you, uh, to have you on and, uh, thank you for that. And, and if there's anything, you know, obviously, you know, this already, but if there are, are things out there that, that people want to, um, want to talk about, you know, welcome to reach out if yeah. there's, uh, courses, some of the classes that I offer, um, that you would, you would like to, to discuss me coming in and, and providing or some, you know, policy and procedure development, um, conversations about, uh, pre-planning, things like that. Yeah. Um, more than welcome That'd be great. to do that and, and have those conversations, um, and, and see, you know, how we can work that out. So, uh, yep. I do consulting. I'm, I'm available for that type of thing. So great. Uh, you get the brother discount. Uh, that'd be good. If there's anybody out there, if there's a uh, people out there or agencies out there associated with you that you guys will, you know, within the county or whatever want to do, um, 
yep, you get the brother discount. Um, it also means I get to stay at your house. So, um, yeah, yeah. I don't know if that, that doesn't feel like a discount. Yes. I mean, yeah. I'll bring, I'll bring, <laughs> how about that? I'll bring some. All right, all right. Now, I, now I think we have a deal. Yeah, that's sure. All right. I like it. Um, thank you very much for uh, tuning into uh, scenes of violence and we will see you next month. Many thanks to Mark, uh, how for all of his, uh, technical, expertise and the things that he does to keep uh to keep our shows up and running um thank you so very much chris i love you thank you for coming on hey right, man thanks man i appreciate it we will see you all next month stay safe breathing in diesel exhaust fumes is like walking into a fire without a mask over time those toxins lead to cancer protect yourself with magna grip the easiest, most reliable exhaust removal system that features a true 100% seal to eliminate diesel exhaust fumes. To get free grant assistance, visit